Hey everybody, it's Collect the Dude. I'm going to do a different one today. The Alex Ross Marvel Comics Poster Book. This is absolutely gorgeous. Featuring 35 removable, frameable prints plus giant poster. This is so pretty. It's like you look at this. Here's the back. This is the front. Here's the back. It's pretty heavy too because all the pit pictures and everything, the posters, each one of these comes out and they're as tall as this and they're just beautiful. But here's um, the pull-out poster that you can get that's in here that you'll get that's in here. Look at that, Ghost Rider all the way to Punisher. <laughs> it's just awesome. And all of these are comic book covers too, which is cool. Here, 35 removable, frameable prints plus pull-out poster. Look at, here's, look at that. Uh, Silver Surfer, Medusa, uh, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Thing, Wolverine, Starlet Witch, and Iceman. That is awesome. Look at this, it says, From Angel to Wolverine, all your favorite Marvel comic superheroes are featured in this exclusive collection of painted portraits by Alex Ross, one of the most respected and influential artists working in comics. The first ever collection of these iconic images includes 35 ready-to-frame removable art prints, perfect for longtime Marvel fans and those just discovering these classic heroes for the first time, as well as commentary, which I love that stuff, preliminary sketches, and a bonus four-page gatefold of the portraits. There it is assembled into a mural that was commissioned for Marvel's New York City offices. This heroic, these heroic posters showcase the Marvel superheroes as you've never seen them before, as realistic as any on the silver screen, painted in the award-winning, breathtaking style that made Alex Ross famous. Very cool. They even, people are even selling these on uh, eBay, like for, was it $12 or $20, something like that. They, they tear them out. They sell them singly. You can you can frame every single one of these. And see, I, they they made them into a whole bunch of different things here. This is uh, Thor, and there's uh, Captain America, and there's Silver Surfer. It's too tall for my ceiling in here. And then Iron Man. They're just really cool. So they do, they got them in comic books, and they got them in these standees. You can get them in standees. So uh, I'll put the uh, the website for the standees in the description because I did a video showing an unboxing of all of these and everything and how I put them in the room. So they're very cool. And I got my other stuff here just for backdrop. But let's open this up and check, check out, check this out because look, wow, this paper's thick. Look at this, uh, the, the pencil covers too. Then they also have them in pencil covers. If you get like the special comic book, um, variants, um, they have the, uh, penciled versions of them. Well, they're a little bit more, like 50, I've seen them going for 50, up to 80 or more dollars. And if they're graded, they're even more, you know. Well, I think what's cool, I noticed this earlier. This is Spider-Man here. See his arm? And then he changed some of them. So he put his arm down here, which is cool. So it's just cool to see that. When you see, like, the faces, now they look a little bit different in the uh, pencil form. But then when he paints them, they look different. It's just more realistic. It's just awesome. And then when you see, also seeing his artwork inked and colored like regular comic books, it's kind of weird because you, you want to see them painted. But when they do different things like that of different versions of his comic books and they're penciled and inked and colored, it's kind of different. But uh, here's the Alex Ross Marvel Comics poster book. Here's uh, Johnny Storm as Damon Torch. And this is cool too because there's a different version of this as well as you look further into the book. I flipped through it real quick just to see. Okay, this is in memory of Dave Cockrum. And I got a book that I want to do of this one as well. I want to do like a flip through of Dave Cockrum. He, they did a big uh, art book of his stuff. And it's really pretty. So I'm going to do that one as well. Okay, then we get, we're down here. Before we do the Marvel mural, you see the different pencil versions of them down here. It's just awesome. So, just nice. Let's see what we got. Let's see what he says here. Um, a Marvel mural. Planning for this series of full figure por portraits goes back to 2018. Wow. It wasn't the intention of the commission to have me create multiple pieces, but simply to paint one very large composition. In addition to the other work I was engaged in creating for Marvel Comics, they proposed I do a mural to be installed in their New York offices. And that's very cool too, I sh they show that as well. And you, you can see it online too, if you go uh, 
to Alex Ross's site and stuff like that, or you go to his uh, Facebook page, that he shows a lot of this stuff. Plus, he's going to be doing villains just like this. The way he did the, uh, the good guys, the heroes, he's doing villains now. And I got them all ordered right now. I pre-ordered them because I want to make sure I get all of them. And I'm going to use some of them for prizes because they're beautiful. And I did it with the villains as well. Let's see what this is just to give. Um, I did it with the, um, the good guys, the heroes. And I used some of those for prizes. So here we go. Let's see. The image itself would be an enlargement of a smaller painting, which would be adhered to the long wall in their lobby. The smaller piece of art would still have many challenges in the amount of detail in order to hold up at that larger scale. Instead of conceiving an, an involved scene with different depths of detail, which, you know, George Perez did that all the time. It would be awesome to see a, a mural of him, that he did in their office. I counter-proposed the concept of having life-size figures of many of Marvel's greatest heroes lined up along the lobby wall, which he did that with DC, and that'd be beautiful. Here he is talking about it. Going back to my work done for DC Comics, I painted a series of full-body portraits of many of their well, most well-known characters. I got Batman. I had I had a wall, po a door poster for him, which were released as posters starting in the late 1990s. Wow, which were blown up to life-size proportions. These pieces were designed light lighting wise to fit together however they might be lined up i held on to the same ambition with marvel's characters knowing that there had to be a different attitude in the approach to their heroes the key about painting the figures separately was to allow the mural project to, to have an additional life as to how the artwork could be utilized like the, like the standees in the comic books if each body is a separate portrait then other uses, like the poster book you hold in your hands, would be possible. And it's very cool. Instead of doing one piece of art with overlapping bodies standing in front of one another, like he did with the Kingdom Come, I was looking to render each individual figure one by one. That is so cool. The initial sketch I did in preparation for the job to see if Marvel and I were going to, to be on the same page creatively um, used 19 heroes on an 11 by 17 inch sheet of paper. That's cool. I picked only those I thought might make the cut if you were limiting Marvel's characters to their most iconic. To be fair, once you get past the first 10 or so that might be uh, universally agreed upon, the choices start to become subjective. Hmm. Okay. The biggest change I received to my layout was that. Turn the page. And see, that we got over here. There's more here. This is more rough. That is so cool. Okay. And then we got hit. the the length of the wall. I would be working with was twice the the space I had been planning for, and I needed to add many more characters. It was a great relief that Marvel never dictated to me a list of who to include. Since I have strong opinions, and that could have um, been a conflict. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, they fully supported my choices. That's cool. Is it the who and the why? Let's see now. Picking who should be featured in a mural, Marvel mural, is something of a history retrospective. There are core characters who define the popularity of the Marvel Universe, like Spider-Man, and heroes who have been who have enjoyed a higher profile in recent years that, that elevates their often overlooked importance, like Black Panther. Okay. What will likely disappoint many followers of Marvel is who I left out. I avoided heroes who were redesigned or fundamentally restructured in modern usage, since that took away something that was as time-tested as the looks of those I included. Hmm. Here we go down here. Look at this. All these, I guess he, he's had to spread them out. He's got them all numbered. How many is he going to put in there? That's cool. And see, this is what I was talking about. See, look at Johnny Storm. He's got him half on flame and half just uh, Johnny Storm in the uh, FF suit. But he, ch he decided to change it and make him fully flammable. And see, I was thinking about this. I was a firefighter for 15 years. And these guys might be able to stand the heat like Silver Surfer, Hulk, Submariner, maybe and uh sue storm but when you're standing next to flame like that you know what it's like to stand next to a bonfire or 
a fireplace or something like that. It gets really hot. So you can imagine this. Plus I saw like a an excerpt from Terminator 2 when they made Terminator 2 when the um, T-1000 uh, robot came out with the liquid. And he had to do a scene where he stood in the flame and then he walked out of the flame like real bad when they and they did this CGI over top of him and it was cool but he said it was so hot he was burning his back and his ears and everything it was a pretty cool video on YouTube but here we go here clearly the designs featured with this lineup favor costumes that mainly define the super bean in their earliest incarnations it is perfectly appropriate to go ahead and perceive me as a stodgy old fan who likes things to be the way they were when I was a kid. Opportunities like this commission showcasing different aesthetics the way I most enjoyed them and how they were when they entered my life are too good to pass up. What I am clearly doing is preaching about a way to depict the basic identities of these heroes, hoping to make converts to my point of view. Very cool. The how, he says. Starting off, I largely settled on poses that fit the spaces they occupied in the group composition. Each character's in individual attitudes would naturally inform how they were to be posed. I avoided making any one character too interactive with the character alongside them so as to limit uh, how they stood or kneeled on their own. For example, Spider-Man. Okay, go down here. Crouching down no matter his surroundings is a characteristic pose for him. A greater example of what the individual portraits hold is how I reassessed Falcon, Falcon while painting him. I finished a full figure piece of his pose with his arms crossed before I realized I ne neglected to include his sidekick, Red Wing. Wow, that's cool. Given that his bird accompanies him most of the time, almost like an, an accessory. Cool. It seemed necessary to somehow add Red Wing into the pose. I envision pairings with Captain America and Falcon in other graphic uh, combinations. For example, Cap was designed to fit back to back with Iron Man, which up here, <laughs> I didn't put them, I put them like this way. Maybe I'll switch them around a little bit. That's cool, because like Cosmic with uh, the God Thor and then Captain America with Iron Man. Wow, that'd be cool. So here we go. I started from scat, I started from scratch and unfolded Falcon's arms and expanded his wide spread, uh, his wingspan, his wing spread, adding red wing perched on his right arm, ra wings raised. To fit in the combined group shot, the bird is removed completely from behind Iceman so as not to be blocked, saved ultimately for a space where he is seen in full, like this book, or the cover of the comic book that he did. <laughs> So the paintings were done in gouache watercolor with both transparent and opaque execution. I always wanted to see videos of him painting and he's finally got some up where you see him and he makes it look so easy. He, he draws the picture and then he paints over top of it and he adds other colors to it and he's just, wow, because he's so good at it so he knows what he's doing. Okay, often when you see white in my work, it is simply the white of the paper. I decided on a shadow effect with all the figures to create a nearly completely dark side on their right with a warm light source coming from the left. You will notice that no one is casting shadows upon another, which they would given which they would given how closely they are standing. Also the practicality of how the flame of the human torch would probably affect everyone near him isn't too realistically considered. That's what I was saying, because I, like I said, I know what it's like when I was a firefighter. I, I got burned a little bit like on my wrist when I reached up to um, to reach for something when we were in a fire, and my sleeves came down. They weren't hooked correctly when I first started, and I burnt my wrist. I'm like, what the heck? I feel like I'm burning my um, my uh, wrist, and it wasn't. It was just I, I, like little bees were stinging me. I had to hurry up and grab them and pull them down, but I learned my lesson there. Always keep your um, wrist covered and everything covered. And your face, we had to wear a mask and everything, all that stuff. Well, so here he is. He's talking about how the flame isn't too realistic. He said, although She-Hulk and Silver, over, Surfer could take the heat, yes, and the Torch's sister, Sue to his left, could be using her invisible force shield to shield him. I have no excuse for where Shang-Chi's foot ended up. Yeah, here we go up here. That's cool. Just the sketches. Awesome.
Okay, let's go back here. Most of the figure painting paintings are only 28 to 29 inches tall, plus the addition of proportionately proportionally larger elements like the silver surface surfboard. Yeah, like I said, it's real tall, and I have to have a higher ceiling. Uh, Ghost Rider's motorcycle or Angel's wings. Each piece varied, and they have a, a standee of him, Angel. And they don't have, they don't have one of Ghost Rider, which would have been really cool. But each piece varied in a production time between 7 to 10 hours. So I was generally able to paint one full figure a day. That's cool. I did not work on all the pieces in a row. Since regular cover commitments and a whole painted comics project interrupted the flow. I started in early 2019 and after putting it aside due to other work distractions, came back to complete it by the fall. That's cool. Look at this down here. All these pencils versions here. And see, there's a better, more finished picture of um, Johnny Storm half and half like that. That's cool. And here's different people he's going to add. I think that's Sue Storm. Or I think that's a storm there. But that's cool. Man, there's Hawkeye down there. That's cool. And hopefully Hawkeye, the the actor guy, hopefully he's doing better now since he had his he had a snowmobile accident. Hopefully he's going to do that, get out of that beer. Okay, I saw him make a post on Facebook or something that he's doing okay and thank you for the good wishes and stuff. He had little bruises on his face, but hopefully he gets better and gets back to work pretty soon and everything like that. But it's like just freaky stuff. When stuff like that happens, you're like, wow, man, anybody can get hurt. You know, you never you never know what's going to happen. You just have to be careful. So let's see. Okay, here the what. One of the usual tools I was able to use in my development of this project was a life-size statue I based my painting on for the last, for at least one character. And I saw that before. That was Captain America. So like this one here, that was very cool. I mean, to be to have that in his, in his house and everything. For years, I was in need of a perfect reference model for my depiction of Captain America. I wanted something to look at and show off that had the exact detail of costume and huge muscular size that I felt was what the comic art had always indicated. With the help of an existing fiberglass statue, a casting of my life model's head, and the casting and fabrication skills of one of my oldest friends and models, Ken Coy, he was once my model for Spider-Man. That's cool. We set the work Greek. We set the work creating a custom statue of my vision for Cap. I sculpted a mask and and facial details on my friend Frank Casey's head cast, put in glass eyes, repainted the whole thing darker colors, true to an actual American flag, and made it look like a real guy was standing there. Yep, and he is. You can even buy the head cast and like Spider-Man cast and stuff like that, real size cast and like uh, Green Goblin at one time. You probably get them on fa on YouTube as well. Using this piece for photo reference grounded the whole project with a key figure to follow and emulate with similar attention to detail. I have and regularly use many costume props and sculptures that can elevate my understanding of how these 3D forms translate onto the page. And I've seen a lot of his actors that he or Peep, uh, models that he uses because they'll show them in the, in the uh, comic books which is cool years ago I made a chrome gold iron man helmet to study how that surface would appear when I painted it a good deal of my inspiration is to capture stylistic qualities of how superheroes were originally drawn often there are subtle details that get lost over time um the use of painted realism is my way to interpret and keep the forms similar to the way they were when the artist first crafted them. Now that's cool. Now we go last paragraph here, the art. You see that included in this uh, poster book are all 35 single figure portraits, each as their own pinup, ready for framing, with copious notes on the back about the characters and my specific approach on to them. There is also a fold-out poster of the combined artwork matching the, the mural image hanging in the Marvel offices. That's cool. As one last addition, I wanted to include the major Marvel shrinking heroes who were sadly omitted from my lineup. The reason for this was, I reasoned, that since they were only supposed to be small to both get around unseen and sometimes interact with the bugs they were named after, the heroes would 
be only a half inch in height. Yeah, that'd be kind of hard to do that and show them. Despite many presentations where they looked about the size of a doll, I deferred to their intended trunk down proportions. It didn't seem worth putting them in as something no one would see in the mural. And their full size and large forms wouldn't fulfill the promise of their powers. So here they are, seen for the first time, still portrayed larger than they would be in action. The Astonishing Ant-Man, the Wasp, and Yellow Jacket, Alex Ross. He's got them here. This is cool. Look at this. A magnifying glass. And then them over here. So here they are here. Oh, that's cool. Wow. And then down here, you see them. That is cool. So this, I'd love to see this in real life like he does. I wonder how he got that done. Wow, man. Look at the, look at his action figures in the background. I've seen other pictures of interviews with him. And you see in different parts of his room how he has all that in there, in his house. It's like, wow. And see, here's the uh, mural that's in the, in the offices in New York. Look how cool that is. All just the bright colors. I always like the bright colors. And the realism. Here he is. He's um, scraping the um, picture of the painting so it can smooth out the air bubbles and everything to get it on the wall. And there's another picture over here, a bigger one. Like here's the room over here on the end of the wall. Then you see the, part of the bike is off. But wow, that is so cool. All the way over here and then there, there they are. The guy's putting it up on the wall there and you can see outside the windows here. The Hilton. Cool. Now we're gonna go to the posters and see what the first one is here. Ghost Rider, cool, look at this. Look at that face, the flame coming out of the eyes. That high seat on that chopper, that is cool. And the flame coming off the wheels. He doesn't have all the full wheels though in flame. I'm gonna have to see why he chose to do that. But this bike is cool. Wow, and then see there's no wires or anything like that, no, nothing. And look at the reflection in the gas tank. Everything just machine and metal and everything. Cool. The spokes. I like the belt. And see there's um, the boots and everything. Very cool. And see, I, I took a picture of everything so I could read it off so you could see the picture while I'm reading. This is Ghost Rider now. Let's see. This is one of the only... This is one of only a handful of times I have ever illustrated this character. That's what he's saying. Okay, despite the Ghost Rider's emergence as one of the most recognizable Marvel heroes, he's an icon of comics that I rarely grapple with. Okay, wow. To try and present the most timeless version of him, I usually embrace the version I first saw when I was younger. That's cool. In this case, the classic Johnny Blaze stunt rider persona with his second motorcycle, he says. The first motor, the first, the first Ghost Rider possessed bike had flaming wheels but no other personalized details. Hmm. The second bike shown here was the one to establish a skull face shield that would set the style for all of the motorcycles to follow. That's cool. All right. Johnny Blaze's clean, form-fitting leather clothes made this original version, not counting the white costume cowboy ghost rider from the 50s, look more like a superhero. It does. That is so cool. Okay, often his skill, often his skull head was shown with eyeballs and eyebrow expressions. My intent was to connect to the realism of a true skull shape with no attitude enhancement. Yeah. That is so cool. Okay. Trusting that the natural details of a skeleton surrounded by flame are ferocious enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a case where the feature film depictions that have come out since the first time I ever painted him have gone far to prove this point and it is hard for me to compete with the quality of their work that is so cool but I'm only only going to show one on this video just to get through so it's not too long but I'll do a, a few more as I go along maybe two or three at a time but thank you very much for watching let me know what you think 
um, and give me any hints or suggestions for the next videos on other stuff. But you guys have a great day, and Collect the Dude is out.